departed in you tonight. So if you would, stand to your feet and welcome to the platform, Pastor Donnie McClurkin. Hallelujah. So, Father, I pray that you'd give your wisdom and your grace. I pray, Lord God, that you would increase as we decrease. And we declare your glorious word that is transformative. I pray, Lord God, that you would give us the power and infuse us with your anointing that will destroy every yoke and every heart over every life. We pray now, Lord Jesus, by your great hand, by your great power and stretched out arm, we believe and we declare our liberty in totality through you. To you belongs all glory and honor, all dominion and power is yours, both now and forevermore. And everyone just give God a shout of praise in this house. All give him a shout of praise. I'm not going to be before you long, Pastor Bob. Thank God for you and your wonderful wife to all of the saints here. I am a, I am a very good-looking old man, and I am here purposely just to bring the word of God to you. And as I told you the last time that I was here, you're not going to hear <coughs> out of me at all. I don't do that. And God, <coughs> Say it to me. It hurts my throat and it makes me tired. I am just going to deliver to you the word that the Lord has given. And I thank God for his grace. Somebody just say grace. I thank God for his grace. This is a brand new year. We've just come out of our first month and today is the first day of, uh, of we finished our consecration for the month of January in prayer and fasting. So today is my first day really ministering. Uh, and I thank God for his wisdom that he gives on how to conduct yourself and to go forward in the year. You always must consult the Lord in what it is that he has planned for the next season. And the season that he's given us now is a season of change. I was so blessed by what Pastor Bobby said at the beginning concerning how to deal with fallen uh, preachers and the like and how either you prepare yourself or God will prepare you. I'm taking that home. Amen. I'm stealing that and I'm going to act like I said that. But you know, and, and this is the time where we have got to learn what grace really is. We use the word constantly in religion, grace, grace, grace. But we really haven't gotten, I found in my travels and my, and, and my interactions with the church, we really haven't comprehended and wrapped our minds around what grace really is. Hallelujah. Grace is not an excuse to do wrong. Grace does not give you the opportunity nor the privilege to stay in sin so that, yeah, and you can use that as a catchphrase, as a get out of jail free card. But grace is specific. It is specific. Hallelujah. Grace is specific. In the book of Zechariah, uh, I don't have my phone now. In the book of Zechariah, the fourth chapter, the sixth and the seventh verse. If, if you, did y'all put it up on the screen? Y'all got the Bible on the screen? Y'all ain't got no Bible on the screen? I thought, Lord, I thought this was a progressive church. Could you give me one? And you know, in the 21st century, you don't carry the hard copy Bible anymore. Just the phone and you got to pray to God that the battery don't die. But if you'll go with me to the book of Zechariah. Zechariah, the fourth chapter. Hallelujah. Zechariah 4, verses 4 and 6. I'm sorry, verse 6 and 7. It says this, And then he answered, and spoke unto me, saying, 
This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Saying unto Zerubbabel, it's not by your might and it's not by your power, but it's by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, a flat plain. And he shall bring forth a monument, a headstone. He shall bring forth a monument, therefore, with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. The only text and theme that I have today is grace. Somebody holler grace. Grace. Grace, grace is more, and see, in our churches we were taught that grace was the unmerited favor of God. And that was, the, that was the colloquial spiritual terms that we use. Grace meant the, un, the unmerited favor of God. The favor of God that you did not merit or deserve. But in my study and in my search, I found that it was something a little deeper than just the unmerited favor of God. I found out that grace really meant the supernatural ability to do what you could not do in the natural. The supernatural ability to do what you could not do in the natural. Grace empowers us. Grace infuses us with the ability to stay clear and walk away from, divest ourselves of the things that we fell to constantly. Grace gives us the power to break and destroy everything that once held us bound, that kept us in a redundant cycle. A redundant cycle of practices that we could not seem to break, no matter how many New Year's resolutions that we made, no matter how many promises that we made, we always found that we broke them because we didn't have the power and the strength in ourselves to do it. Every good intention didn't mean that you had the power to do Somebody needs to say amen. Because everybody in this room has had a situation where you made up your mind to do something but failed at the task. Even after you came to Jesus. Failed at the task and found yourself with a heavy heart because you thought that you could do it but you cannot do it in your own strength. What God told them, what God spoke through Zechariah was, it is not by our might or our physical or intellectual power, but it is by God's spirit. And he is the one that gives us the ability to look at our mountains, which were unsurmountable, the mountains that stood before us generationally. The mountains that we've had to struggle with and people made up so many silly songs climbing up the rough side of your mountain. You can't climb these mountains and you were never given the power to do so. God gave instruction that if you have a mountain in front of you, don't put on your hiking boots. You've got to utilize the grace that God gave you and the faith that God gave you. And you've got to stand in your authority and speak to the mountain. And tell that mountain you're not bigger than my God. And by the power of God invested in you, cast that mountain into the sea. And do not doubt in your heart. He said, who art thou, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall be leveled down and made a plain. And he said, and there shall be, and there shall be a headstone or a monument set there. What does that mean? In the Old Testament, wherever God did a wonderful work, wherever God did a miracle, you would put rocks. You would put stones. And you would build a pillar or a monument of stones to remember and mark, to dedicate and earmark where God did the miracle. They called it an Ebenezer. 
You would raise up an Ebenezer, and that Ebenezer was simply, the, 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 the definition of Ebenezer is, hitherto, to this very point, has the Lord helped us. And that's what it is. He said, and you shall raise up a headstone with writings on it, shouts and cryings, grace. That simply means that not just a physical, you know, a monument built of stone, but we ourselves become the monument. We ourselves become the testimony that if it had not been for the Lord who was on our side, we would have been consumed. If it had not been for God, we wouldn't have made it this far. God gave us something so significant and he called it grace. Grace. If you read, let me, let me, let me become a little less animated. If you read the book of John, John the first chapter really it, it juxtaposes and really speaks to define Genesis 1. John 1 deals with Genesis 1 in depicting who Jesus really is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they started with the genealogies, with the human genealogy. But John did not. John didn't go into Mary and Joe and all the rest of them and, and Rahab. He didn't go into all that. John went way past the human history of Jesus and he went into the eternal. John utilized the Genesis in order to depict Jesus. For Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form of void. You know. John says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him is nothing made that is made. He's giving definition to the Genesis experience. And God said, let there be light in Genesis 1. And John said, Jesus, he, the word, was the life and the light of the world. And the light shone in darkness. And the darkness could not comprehend it. So darkness isn't just an absence of luminous, but darkness is a being that could not comprehend what the light is doing. Hallelujah. A fallen figure from heaven who was called the prince of darkness could not comprehend what the light was doing. The, 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 the mind of the enemy couldn't fathom that God himself would wrap himself up in human flesh that God himself would become a spermazoa and be placed in a 14 year old virgin's womb without copulation darkness could not comprehend that the word the word would take on form and just stay in a womb for nine months take on human I'm sorry I'm screaming again take on humanity hallelujah and come into this earth legally because only those that have this are legal on this earth hallelujah that's the reason why Satan just can't take over that's the reason why satanic powers cannot just destroy because they are illegal the sons and daughters that were made in the image and the likeness of God. I'm about to break my promise. The sons and daughters. Which were made in the image and the likeness of God. They have dominion on this earth. And the darkness could not comprehend what the light was doing. Hallelujah. And then the Bible said in John the first chapter, the 14th verse, he said, and the word was made flesh. And we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And it is the grace of God that appeared to all men. For in order for us to deny ungodliness, it was the grace of God. No power that we had 
of our, of our own. And every one of us that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, you have been blessed with the grace of God. For you are saved by grace. You are supernaturally endowed with power that you did not have in the natural. You are saved by grace through your faith. And that grace has given you the power in order to prevail in every situation. If I was in another church right now, if I was in another church, I would have a theme for this message. And I would tell you to look at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor, this is what grace looks like. Oh, this is what grace did. This is what grace brought about. This is what grace redeemed. This is what grace salvaged. This is what grace made. This is what grace put in place. This is what grace looks like. You have got to tell the truth, y'all. Before you met Jesus, you were a mess and a half. Oh, you didn't look anything like you look like now. You didn't act like anything you're acting like now. You didn't think like you think now. Before you met Jesus, you were a piece of work. Some of us didn't want anybody to know us before we met Jesus. Some of us, it was a good thing we didn't know you before we met Jesus. Amen. Some of you had a real, a real life, a, a jacked up life before you met Jesus. Some of you barely made it out. And, and if you recount the things that you did and the way that you lived and the thoughts that you had and the cycles that you ran in, if you recall the things that you were a part of and that were a part of you, you don't know and don't understand how God did it. You don't understand how he destroyed that power over you. You don't understand how he delivered you. All you can say is grace. All you can say is grace. You must admit that you were something that wasn't pleasant. Think about it. You weren't. You weren't pleasing to God nor man. You must admit you were bound by things that you could not necessarily be freed from. No, I was good. I was good. That wasn't me. I was, I was pretty good before I met Jesus. And he just made my life better, but I was good. All right. And uh, there, you, there is no goodness in man. In this flesh dwells no good thing. Hallelujah. Then I, you may not have you did heroin or killed somebody, but you are going to the same hell. No, not over here? Okay, I'll talk to you. You may not have murdered a baby, you may not have killed a dog, but you are going to the same hell with your good self. <laughs> You are on your way to the same hell without God. But God who is rich in... He saw something in us that we didn't see in ourselves. Some of us in this room told God, I'm not worthy. Some of us in this room told God, I don't deserve you. He said, I know, but that's what my grace is about. There's nothing that a man can do to deserve the love of God, but it is the grace of God that has given us the opportunity to live this thing. Amazing grace. How sweet that sounds. That saved a wretch like me. This is what grace looks like. We are living, breathing, walking, talking, billboards and advertisements 
of the grace of God. When people see us, they see someone who's been transformed. They see someone who has absolutely been converted and changed. They see someone that that could not do it on their own. But God, but God, but God did something in us that we could never repay. Showed us something that we could never have deserved. He did this in us and then made us look like the sin never happened. Oh, because if, if, if I were to ask you to raise your hand and enumerate the things you were bound to, people would be amazed because he transformed you. They would have never believed that you were doing the things that you were doing, that you were being the person that you were being, that you were running with the bunch of knuckleheads you were running with. They would have never believed that you were saying the words that you were saying and smoking the stuff you were smoking and drinking the stuff you were drinking. They would have never believed some of the things that went on in your mind and in your heart. They would have never believed that you could ever sink to that level and be that low. But the bottom line is sin has no limit to the lows it will bring you. Sin can take you to the lowest low. And then when you found yourself at the rock bottom of sin, you found out through grace that God's love goes deeper than the lowest sin and can salvage you and bring you up out of the dregs of your depression and the dregs of your deeds and the dregs of your vileness and the dregs of your sinful lusts. He can take you out of that thing, wash you in his blood, establish your feet upon a rock and make you look like you really are the son and the daughter of the most high God. Can somebody give God a scream of gratitude? Grace, 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 grace. Grace gives us the ability to look directly in the face of the sin and the devil that had us bound and say, you should have killed me when you had me, but it's too late now. You should have killed me when I was, when I was running with you. Excuse me, I didn't mean you. When I was running with you. I'm sorry, I just got to be me. You should have killed me when I was running with you, boy. You should have killed me when you had me. When I was smoking, when I was drinking, when I was popping, when I was banging. You should have killed me then. You should have killed me on the street when I was running with the crowd. You should have killed me driving drunk. You should have killed me when you had me. But I found something out. You couldn't kill me. Because grace had a purpose for me. Even when I was in my sin, you couldn't kill me. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Even when I was in my wrong, you couldn't kill me. Because in my wrong state, he still had angels around me. Because he had an assignment for me. For God has given his angels charge over you. To keep you in your holy ways. To keep you in your righteous ways. For God has given his angels charge over you. To keep you in all of your ways. Stop. Think about that. I know we're religious. I know we're Christian. Godly people. But when he said to keep you in all of your ways, telephone, to keep you in all of your ways, that means the good and the bad because you had an assignment. There was a purpose for your entrance on this earth. And God did not plan for sin to take you out. No, no, see y'all sitting up here acting like I ain't talking about y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all act like, you know, is he right, Pastor? And, uh, <laughs> I 
The assignment that you had and the purpose for God birthing you was greater than your sin. Others have died doing less than you did. And you're still here. <laughs> Am I talking to anybody here? Others have died doing less than you've done and you're still here. The question is why? Grace. 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 Some of us have been this close to death. How did you get out of that? It wasn't by your ingenuity. It wasn't by your feeble ability. It was something more divine. Grace. 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 Some of you were so depressed that you didn't even want to live. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about in this room. I'm not talking about hypothetically. I'm talking about people here. Some of you have gone through depression to the point where you didn't want to live anymore. A couple of you tried to even take your own life. But you're still here. And you woke up, you lived to see another day. And experienced the love that healed your broken heart. And taught you that the worst can never take away the best. And you are the best. And the worst can always be over. But you, my brother and sister, you cannot be overcome. Because God has a purpose for you. And the only reason why you're still here and did not succumb to suicide was because of grace. Grace heals a broken heart. Grace empowers you to get up from the rubble of your past. Grace destroys generational curses. Grace empowers you to do what you could have never done. Grace gives you the ability not only to be the example but to pass it on to your children and your children's children. Grace saves your family. Not just you, but you and your household. Grace. Grace. It was by the grace of God that my family was saved. It was by the grace of God that we got out of our generational curse. It was by the grace of God that I'm able to stand here today and talk to you in a sane mind. Well, so. It is by the grace of God that the rape at eight years old didn't kill me. The rape three times in one night by a great uncle didn't kill me. Hallelujah. It is by the grace of God that the breaking of the body did not break the soul. Yeah. Somebody have a grace. Yeah. It was by the grace of God that as the atrocity happened, God allowed my mind to be covered as the atrocity took place three times until the dawn. An eight-year-old body being ravaged. How does an eight-year-old that has no buffer, that has no mental strength, that is an empty slate, being so atrociously abused, penetrated and treated like a piece of rag? How? Does that child escape? How does that child get past the son of his rapist molesting him at 14 in the parking lot of the church and nobody even realizing that the boy is not inside? How does his life continue on without being so scarred that he is of no use to man nor beast? How does this young man square his shoulders and break the bands of homosexuality and overcome the struggles of the flesh? I don't know. I, no, 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 no. I'm talking about me. And if I, I know you may not be able to understand it, but there is grace that delivers. There is grace that frees. There is grace that heals. There is grace. Oh, I didn't know that about him. Yeah, yeah, I know, because if you would have known that about me, you may have judged me wrongly because you can't look at the man and see those things. They're in the heart. But God has dealt with the inner man and caused healing 
by grace, by grace, by grace, by grace, by grace, by grace. By grace I am saved. It is the gift of God. Not by any works. By grace I have been delivered. By grace I have been freed. By grace I have been empowered to speak to other people who are still dealing with the wounds, with the scars that have not turned into wounds yet. The scars that still, the, 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 the wounds that haven't turned into scars yet. The wounds that still bleed in church still bleeding in religion still bleeding in Christ still bleeding the memory is triggered by words the memory is triggered by thought the memory triggers and causes emotions because we haven't really been healed yet hallelujah say a person's name say a person's name and it triggers and Smell a smell and it triggers and it hear a phrase and it triggers something. Ah, that's because you haven't really been healed. But when grace has its full effect, when grace has its full effect, and you realize that what came upon me could not destroy me, grace gives you the power, the supernatural ability to forgive those that you could not forgive in the natural to stand at the bedside of your rapist as he's dying and say all is known and all is forgiven you can go to heaven now sir no 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 well he no he can't go to heaven he raped you oh no god god's grace goes even to the child molester i didn't hear anything over here god's grace God's grace is extended to whomever will repent. That is the unconditional love of God. <laughs> you meant it for evil, but God turned it around for my good. God's grace for what you did to test me turned into my testimony. By grace some of us are hiding the things that we've been through some of us are covering the things that we've been through because they're too heinous and they're too painful to remember listen when God's grace is applied he heals you of all the pain how do you know that you're healed you know Tianda, uh, I'm sorry please but how do you know see God is not just the God of your present situation God is not just the God of your future but God is also the God of your past and God is not bound by time. God is not bound by time. This is time. And this is eternity. God stands outside of time and manipulates time. And when you are in your time and on your way to your time to come, God can go back to your time past and where you were broken he can fix it let me put it to you like this Bible says God said I will restore to you the years that the caterpillar and the palmer worm and the canker worm and the locust destroyed he said I'll restore those years to you and I don't hear anybody in here he said I'll give you back the time I'll allow you to redeem the time. This is the God that we serve. He is not just a God. He is the only God. And he doesn't have power. He is power. Did you hear what I said? He doesn't have power. He is power. And he can walk into your past while you're in your present and heal your past while you're standing in your present on your way to your future. That's the power of our God. And how would Donnie that sounds crazy Donnie that doesn't make sense how will you how, how can you say that how will you know that God has healed your past well you know that God has walked into your past 
when you can remember your past, but now remember it without the pain. That's how you know that he's, he's healed your past. That there's no more unforgiveness. That there's no more tears at the remembrance of it. That you don't have to hide it anymore. You can stand up and open up your coat and let them see your scars. Your scars meant that, meant that you've been wounded, but you've also been healed. A scar is proof that you were wounded, but you were also healed. Grace. 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 It is by the grace of God. The Bible said in the book of James, the fourth chapter, the sixth verse, it said, and he giveth more grace. He continuously gives out this supernatural ability to deal with what you could not deal with in the natural every day is a brand new mercy and he gives more grace he gives you the power to overstep the pitfalls he gives you the power to be able to discern what is right and what is wrong he gives you more grace the bible said the bible said in the book of hebrews fourth chapter hebrews fourth chapter about 16 first he says that you can boldly come before the throne of grace boldly as children you have access to the throne as children there was a story there was a story that President JFK President John Fitzgerald Kennedy was in a summit meeting in the Oval Office of the White House sitting with world leaders World leaders discussing matters of great import. And all of a sudden the door burst open. And a little John Jr. runs in and jumps on his dad's lap. In the middle of the summit meeting. And he hugged his son, twirled on his seat in front of the leaders. Because John Jr. had the privilege as son to come boldly into the Oval Office, to the seat of the presidency, the most powerful seat in the free world. He had the privilege to boldly come to the seat of power, interrupt the meeting and gain the favor of his father. That's grace. That no matter what's going on in the world, you can interrupt God and come before his throne. Not as an angel, but as a son. And come as a blood-washed son and daughter of the Most High God and get God's attention and get mercy and more grace for the hour of your need. I'm talking to somebody who should be exploding right now. And, 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 and this is the privilege of sonship. The privilege of sonship. We can utilize access by grace. And we shall do so. There's nothing that I'm going through that I cannot handle. For grace has given me the power. There's nothing that I've been assigned to do that I cannot accomplish. For it is not by my power nor by my might. But it is by his spirit. And I have the grace to do so. Whatever he lays in front of me, I can accomplish. I can accomplish. Oh God, I want to scream so bad. No, 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 no. Because I don't want this to be based on emotionalism. I want this to be based on understanding and revelation that grace has appeared unto us. That we may not be utilizing to its fullest extent. That we may not be utilizing to its fullest extent. 
What are the things that we're still bound to? What are the habits that we're still fighting with? What are the addictions that we're still waiting for God to deliver us from? God can't deliver you from anything that you're still holding on to. Please take this from me. No, 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 please take this from me. No, please take this from me. No, I'm asking you, please, please, please take this from me. No, really, it's, 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 it's too dark. No, you, yes, you can take this from me, please. And that is the same thing we do with God. We ask him to take things from us that we're still holding on to. Because in our flesh, we can't seem to part with some things. In in our flesh, we still can't seem to let go of some things. So we make excuses for our habits. I'm still saved. I just struggle with this. It's it's only a struggle because you won't let go. If you let go, it wouldn't be a struggle anymore. It's not a struggle anymore. And I'm, I'm making it simple because we make it so complex. We make excuses for what we want to keep when grace gives us the ability to let it go grace empowers us to let it go the thing we couldn't let go in our own strength am I making any sense to anybody well I'm still a Christian I know but you're dealing with struggles that you shouldn't have Grace should have freed you. Grace would have freed you. Grace could free you. But you've got to want to. You've got to want to. Grace has appeared. The supernatural ability to do what you could not do in the natural. They told. They, can I come down here? They told me that the sexual battle that I had uh, put a D on the end of that. That, that it was, it was, it was irrevocable. You, 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 you weren't sure that way. You're always that way. They told me. They told me that this is just accept who you are. They told me. Christ loves you just as you are and he doesn't want you to change. He made you like that. Now it's God's fault. They told me that this is who I am based on my proclivities, based on my predilections. And if I didn't know God, I would have believed them. As many I read a scripture. See, it's, it's, it's dangerous when you get into the Bible. Because the Bible, the, the word of God, mixed with faith, contradicts the things that are in, in the natural. The Bible said, it told me, the Bible told me, If any man at all be in Christ, not know about Christ, be in Christ, not be familiar with, be in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things are passed away. 
Y'all, 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 I'm closing. I'm closing. I got 25 seconds, 24 seconds. The, the old things, the old things are passed away. And then he said, and behold, that means there's got to be someone to look at. There's got to be an example. That means there's got to be an example of grace in action. There's got to be an example for people to see. You are the example for people to see. You are the example. Hey, well, how did you stop smoking? I thought you did grace. Great. I didn't think I could. I was praying to God and, and it would just and I get upset and just I didn't even realize I was doing it. How did you stop? Man, you were smoking a pack of five packs, ten packs a day. How did you stop? Grace. I didn't think I could ever stop either. Grace. How did, when did you stop drinking? When grace appeared. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. And behold, all things, not some, all things, not most, all things. When did you stop cussing? You used to cuss like you was a sailor. Man. When grace appeared. God said he doesn't want us to be bound by any secret sin. And although we could not find excuses, there is none. For grace takes away our excuse. Am I talking to anyone here? I understand, I understand because I've been there. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse himself from his ways? Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a young man cleanse himself from his way? By taking heed unto your word. Your word has been hidden in my heart so that I can stop sinning against you. Grace. Where's my piano player? You, if you don't play, I'm going to keep talking. <laughs> come on, come on. I got to teach you how to be black. Get on that. <laughs> if you want to, if you want to preach to, to reel it in, start playing. I would have never been able to stop and break the cycle and the practice without grace. The grace that enables, the grace that empowers, the grace that comes from God. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. I guess I got to get in your key. (laughs) Grace, grace. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. After all, that's what saved us. But it can go way past salvation. It can go into every area of our lives. No New Year's resolutions. Just surrender to God. 
No promises that you make that you break. But reliance on God's grace to empower you. Oh, my time is four minutes up. No, I don't. I'm 62. You think I'm sitting here just for, you know. <laughs> no, I'm sitting here because I'm tired. <laughs> but, Pastor, you don't know what you really said today. In a no judgment zone, that young lady who got up here and, and ministered before I did. The power of what you said coupled with the power of those who would believe what you said will cause much deliverance. Much deliverance. Bless you. you are called by God to be strong people. You are a holy nation, a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar people to show forth God's glory and not to have secret hidden sin. Not to, not to have secret sin. God, deliver me from hidden sin. David said, God, deliver me from hidden sin. He said, don't let sin have dominion over me. Those small little foxes, those small little habits destroy vines. If you would utilize the grace of God, I, I'm telling you from a, from a place called freedom, I'm telling you from a place I live called freedom, that I never have to lean back into what I did. I don't have to pull back from what I was broken free from. I don't have to gain, I have to grab a hold of that which I've been delivered from. I'm in a free state. I'm in a place where I never have to go back again. You don't know how good that feels to be free. To not have to ask God's mercy and forgiveness for things that you're redundantly falling prey to. But that in repentance, you can identify the sin and by grace turn away and walk away and never go back again. This place called freedom is wonderful. This place called freedom is liberating. This place called freedom is invigorating. You never have to worry about it again. For it's been crucified on the cross of Calvary. And there is no room in my life for it anymore. My only desire now is to please God. And free from that burden. And free from that struggle. And free from that cycle. I can move on into the victory called life into the victory called life into the victory called life into the victory called life